nitrous acid, an important reagent in organic synthesis, has the formula HNO2. Notice that this contrasts with the formula for nitric acid, which is HNO3. To form the Lewis structure, we notice that each nitrogen contributes five electrons, each oxygen contributes six, that gives us 17 electrons, and then we need one electron for the hydrogen atom. And notice that the hydrogen atom is connected directly to the oxygen and not to the nitrogen. Therefore, we have to allocate the 18 electrons so as to satisfy the duet rule and the octet rule for the oxygens and nitrogens. The only way that will work to do this is that we need to have one single bond between the oxygen and nitrogen and a double bond between nitrogen and oxygen over here and a lone pair on nitrogen, two lone pairs on each of the oxygen. So we notice 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 electrons. So we've used the proper number of electrons to form nitrous acid. Nitrous acid is a weak acid. When it ionizes, it loses H plus and leaves behind electrons so that we have the nitrite ion. So we see that the nitrite ion has 18 electrons. If we weren't sure otherwise, and we were starting just with the ion, we would have six times two electrons for the oxygens, plus five for nitrogen, which gives us 17 electrons. And we realize that the chemical formula for nitrite ion is NO2 with a minus one charge. So we have to add an 18th electron for the minus one charge. So again, we have an 18 electron system. One important thing to notice here is that we can form the Lewis structure by having a single bond between this oxygen and this nitrogen, but a double bond between this oxygen and the nitrogen. But there's nothing special about this particular oxygen over that one. So we could just as well have drawn a second Lewis structure, a second resonance structure, where the double bond was between nitrogen and oxygen on this side, and the single bond was over here. So the true structure for nitrite ion is a resonance structure of the two different forms. So the end result is that the actual structure has two identical nitrogen-oxygen bonds, each of which has a bond length that is approximately a one and a half bond. There is a very important nitrogen oxide called nitrogen dioxide. NO2. NO2 is a very important component of air pollution, particularly in cities. It's an important component of smog. To form the Lewis structure for nitrogen dioxide, we realize that we have two oxygen atoms, each of which contributes six electrons, one nitrogen atom, which contributes five. So we end up with a system that has a total of 17 electrons. So right away, we recognize that we have an odd electron system. Therefore, it has to be a free radical. So let's remove one electron here so that we actually have a total of 17 electrons. This is the actual, now nitrogen dioxide is reactive, but again, it is one of the more stable of the free radicals. As we had mentioned previously, free radicals tend to have two primary reaction mechanisms. One is to become reduced, so, and we had already seen if we gain one electron, we have the nitrite ion. That is a possible mechanism for nitrogen dioxide. But the more common mechanism is for nitrogen dioxide to dimerize. And let's look and see what product we get when nitrogen dioxide dimerizes. By linking two nitrogen dioxide molecules together, we can form a new compound which has the chemical formula N2O4 and which goes by the name of dinitrogen tetroxide. So in this particular molecule we have a total of four oxygen atoms which each contribute six electrons. So that gives us 24 electrons from the oxygens. The two nitrogens contribute a total of 10. So that gives us a total of 34 which is exactly twice the 17 that we found in nitrogen dioxide.
So we have 34 electrons that we have to allocate. And we can do that by having a nitrogen-nitrogen single bond, two nitrogen-oxygen single bonds, and two nitrogen-oxygen double bonds. For the sake of simplicity, we're not going to demonstrate all the possible resonance structures that's left to the student to do. But as you can see, there's nothing special about this oxygen versus that. So we can move around where the double bonds are. So long as we have two single bonds and two double bonds, we will have the accurate structure. The one thing which is not obvious from Lewis theory, but which we get from other experimental evidence is that no matter what resonance structures we draw, the nitrogen-nitrogen bond is going to be a single bond. One of the most interesting and novel compounds ever synthesized is xenon difluoride. Now xenon is one of the noble gases and much of the theory of chemical bonding is based on the idea that the noble gases having a happy number of electrons already don't form chemical compounds. They are unreactive. This was true up until 1985 when the first compounds with xenon were synthesized. Since then, compounds have not only been synthesized with xenon, but also with the noble gas krypton. So far, no compounds have been formed with helium, neon, or argon. So to form the Lewis structure for xenon difluoride, we realize that each fluorine atom is going to contribute seven valence electrons, and we treat the xenon in the next column of the periodic table as contributing eight valence electrons. So this entire compound is going to have 22 electrons. We know that we have to satisfy the octet rule for fluorine, so we have eight around each of those, so that gives us 16. So we have six more electrons to allocate. Four of those are put into the gray areas around xenon because we have to at least satisfy the octet rule. But then since we have these white regions and then we have two right in the center here, we can show that we can expand the octet for xenon. In fact, because xenon starts with eight valence electrons, for virtually every single one of its compounds, it's going to expand the octet. So put our extra two here, which is a valid structure because we can expand the octet for xenon whereas we cannot expand the octet for fluorine. Another xenon compound has the chemical formula XEF4, and that is called xenon tetrafluoride. For this particular compound, each of the fluorines contributes seven valence electrons. Since there's four of those, we get 28 electrons from the fluorines. The xenon contributes eight valence electrons, giving a total of 36 electrons for the entire compound. As a shortcut, we notice that we have to satisfy the octet rule for each of the fluorines. So for each of the four, four fluorines, that uses up 32 electrons right away. So we know that we have, beyond that, four more electrons that we have to allocate. So we get eight electrons around xenon just from the four single bonds to fluorine. And then we have two more as lone pairs. And we can do that, we notice that we have a total of 12 electrons on the central xenon atom, which is allowed because xenon is in the third row or beyond. So with that, we're allowed to expand the octet. It's important thing to notice is if you have an old textbook before 1985, it will tell you that such compounds as xenon tetrafluoride are impossible. But that's no longer true since 1985. And we can use the Lewis theory to predict the structure accurately. And then later on, you'll see that you can use the VSEPR theory to accurately predict the chemical geometry of the compound. 